I have always felt that the ten Beethoven sonatas for violin and piano are those of his works which have received lip service rather than wholehearted devotion on the part of players and convinced acceptance on the part of listeners. This could not very well be otherwise before long playing records made them really accessible to music lovers. How often does one meet others than the Kreutzer, the Spring Sonata, and perhaps the one in G major, number eight, in the concert hall? We can then safely say that the wonderful variety of riches which lie within these ten works have become accessible to the vast general public only in the last decade or so. To hear them in a series used to be the privilege of a few hundred accredited friends of music. Now all this happily is changed. In the book I have lately written about the Beethoven sonatas, I point out how wrong it seems to me to persist in a sort of patronizing attitude to these sonatas. They meant a great deal to Beethoven, whose predilection for and mastery of the piano has overshadowed his interest in the violin. Although he had already played the violin in Bonn in his teens, he took up violin lessons again in Vienna with Schupanzig at a time when he was already a much talked about and controversial personality in Vienna. Now let us listen to the first of the ten, the one in D major. Let the youthful fanfare with which it opens prepare us for the beauty and stimulation and emotion that the whole set has in store for the willing listener. Although it is the first of the ten, it is opus uh, 12, number one, the deceptive simplicity and brilliance of the first movement the ingratiating variation movement and the gaiety and bounce of the concluding rondo should not lead us into thinking of it as a so-called uh, minor early Beethoven. The thrust of the master, his faculty of transmuting a single simple tune in the variation movement, the humor and unexpected touches in the rondo all these are already essential Beethoven. Sonata number two. Whenever I try to evaluate these three sonatas of Opus 12 in the round, as it were, and not one by one, the thought intrudes upon me that the young master, not yet 30, had some special objective in mind when he bound these three works into a bouquet and presented it to Antonio Salieri, with whom he had been having regular lessons during his first years in Vienna. The diversity of approach to these nine movements, the resulting contrasts, the many-faceted personality that emerges when we consider this Opus 12 as a whole, gives me the feeling, I'm of course now speaking for myself, that this special objective might have been to overwhelm the old maestro and to break down the resistance he had shown toward Beethoven. There is a story about Salieri having criticized one of Beethoven's tasks at one lesson and telling him at the next one, I couldn't get your tune out of my head, whereupon young Beethoven replied, 
then it couldn't have been so entirely bad. The second sonata in A major has most unexpected features when compared with its companions. Contrast cannot be greater than between the panache and directness of the opening movements of number one and number three, and this sophisticatedly playful, transparent texture. And the lovely plaintive second movement in A minor sets it quite apart from the variation movement of the first sonata and the exalted tone of the adagio of the third sonata. The concluding movement, which has been called a minuet, rondo, and other things, is wholly unexpected when compared to the more tradition-based rondos of the other two. We see diversity, contrast, seems to have been uppermost in his mind. Sonata number three. I wish it were practicable in the course of these broadcasts to sometimes look backward and sometimes forward and remind the listener by playing just eight or 16 or so bars of a sonata that has been or that will be heard. This juxtaposition in listening experience would approximate the kind of visual juxtaposition we all of us practice when in a gallery of masterpieces we return for a brief moment to a picture we have just a minute ago looked at with intensity, and when we now wish to establish a correspondence with something we see on the same wall, a few feet away. If before playing tonight's sonata, which is in the heroic key of E flat, the key of the Emperor Concerto and the Eroica, the third of the set of three dedicated to Antonio Salieri, if we could have a sampling, just a few measures of all three movements of the preceding second sonata, the one in A major, this would, I think, bear out what I said in the last broadcast about the essential diversity and contrast of this Opus 12. The festive brio of the first movement, the exalted climate of the great adagio, and the high spirits of inventiveness of the rondo do not need a verbal commentary. Sonata number four. The fourth sonata, the one in A minor, opus 23, that we are to hear tonight, has been called the stepchild among the ten. While for the connoisseur, it is one of the most terse, tense, dramatic solution to the problem of the violin piano sonata not only in Beethoven's oeuvre, but in the entire literature for the two instruments. <clears throat> it was written practically at the same time as the Spring Sonata, and each one is a perfect foil to the other. The dramatic concentration of the A minor finds its release in the tranquil, expansive beauties of the spring sonata. The first edition, this was in 1801, was in fact published together with the spring sonata under the title Two Sonatas. It is only later, in 1803, that they were printed separately and were given separate opus numbers. 
how enlightening it would be to hear them together, one after the other, the way they were originally sent into the world by their author. This again is one of those realizations that has only become possible in the last decade or so, since the advent of the long playing record. Sonata number five, the spring sonata. There are certain works of art about which it is embarrassing to speak. Their position has become unassailable, taken for granted. But when we look closer, we sometimes find that they are often admired and loved for the wrong reason. Tonight's offering, the Spring Sonata, the fifth of the set, sometimes puts the musician in the curious position of having to defend it against the snobbery of those for whom rarity is synonymous with beauty and a prerequisite for admiration. Now, the Spring Sonata is anything but rare and its beauty and perfect proportions are of the kind which a German commentator has expressed in two words, one short and one very long one. Höchste Selbstverständlichkeit. This can only be translated by beauty that is in the highest degree and in the highest sense self-evident. It is the first time in the ten sonatas that Beethoven has added a fourth movement to the usual three. After having heard the whole work, let us imagine it without this short and perfect scherzo. We will then have one more proof of Beethoven's infallible sense of the fitness of things, and one more reason to cherish the work. Sonata number six. Tonight's sonata, the sixth of the set, is the first of the three which were dedicated to Tsar Alexander first, and has a first movement of such concentration and fineness of linear texture that it demands full concentration and, uh, I'm searching for the right word, wakefulness in the listener to make its full impact. <clears throat> the closely knit fugal section that comes about midway in this short movement is specially noteworthy and is in keeping with its perfect quartet-like texture. After the concentration of this first movement, the sheer lovely loveliness of the adagio will strike the listener as a reward for the demands that the first movement has made on his alertness and attentiveness. The last movement, a theme and variations, with its bucolic, simple theme, will yield up all its beauties and felicities only to the listener who is aware of the variety of the attitudes and moods of the different variations as the piece unfolds. There is the filigree writing of the first variation, the flowing grace of the second, the toccata-like contrapuntal style of the third variation. The fourth starts with unaccompanied violin chords, which are answered by a chorale-like phrase by the piano. This prepares us for the high seriousness of the fugal variation in minor, which perhaps is the high point of the whole movement. 
the release that the last variation coda brings us rounds off the whole admirable work in a spirit of joyous affirmation. Sonata number seven. The heroic theme of the opening movement of the seventh sonata, the second of the Tsar Alexander set of three, sets the stage for a work that is in a class by itself in the entire violin sonata literature. The key of C minor, the key of the pathetique of the fifth symphony and of the third piano concerto, this key gives it the pathos and the heroic mold which sets it so much apart among its companions. After this, the adagio in A-flat major brings us the appeasement and the contemplative, contemplative mood which the tension and the drama of the first movement made so necessary and inevitable. This inner logic in the way movements of an entirely different cast and climate add up to a whole is one of Beethoven's most significant contributions to our musical heritage. As this sonata has four movements instead of three, this effect of contrast was more than ever necessary. Therefore, the optimism of the C major scherzo is of such importance in the economy of this grandiose and austere work. It ends in a dark-hued C minor finale that has its obsessive repetitions of that initial rumble in the bass of the piano with which it starts. Sonata number eight. Tonight's G major sonata, the eighth of the series, with a final rondo that has such an unmistakable Russian flavor, is one of the more popular of the ten, but it carries with it a misconception in the popular man which has wrongly decreed that the slow movement, the tempo di minuetto ma molto moderato, is too slow moving and too repetitious. Now, it is true that the wonderfully swift and mercurial first movement puts the following molto moderato movement at a disadvantage. And so does, in retrospect, the concluding finale rondo, which carries us along with such an irresistible rhythmic impulse. But, and I repeat what I said about the preceding C minor sonata, this contrast in the pulse of the three movements was necessary and part of Beethoven's blueprint for the whole. When in the 1920s I played this sonata with our great and unforgettable Bruno Walter at the piano, it was in Berlin at the Beethoven Saal, he said to me something very wise when we rehearsed it. Let us play it still more molto moderato, still slower. Don't let us be apologetic about its length. You will then see that it will seem shorter. Sonata number nine, the Kreutzer. When Beethoven gave the Kreutzer its first title, 
in uno stilo molto concertante, he had in it the word brillante between the mo words stilo and molto. He later crossed it out. He could just as well have crossed out concertante and substituted for it sinfonico, for that is the prevailing impression one gets on reading the tremendous first movement in score. The impression of a symphonic movement that strains the resources of the two instruments almost to breaking point. No wonder musicians have succumbed to the temptation of orchestrating it, as they have also in the case of the Bach Chacon. Tchaikovsky orchestrated the first movement of the Kreutzer. The score is preserved in the Tchaikovsky Museum in Klin, in Russia. It must be this heroic attempt to convey a message of symphonic proportions through a lone piano and violin that probably has contributed to the unprecedented prestige this most truly popular violin piano sonata has acquired and continues to enjoy. Its eloquence, the brilliance of its writing, the irresistible contagious pleasure of this joute this uh, contest between the two protagonists, these were, of course, the primary reasons. The ingratiating beauty of the andante con variazioni and the virtuoso, I almost said mondaine, aspect of the first two variations, the emotional contrast of the one in F minor, and the spaciousness of layout and enchanting orchestration of the final variation must also account for the Kreutzer retaining its hold as the best beloved work of its kind. And what audience can resist the sheer momentum and virtuoso contest element of the rauschend roaring, Beethoven used to call such movements, tarantella-like presto finale. Sonata number 10, opus 96. I think it is the utterly new approach to the problem of the violin piano sonata, for problem it has never ceased to be, that captures the imagination of the listener of the last of the ten Beethoven sonatas, the Opus 96, written in 1808 and dedicated to his pupil, Archduke Rudolf. We find in its first movement an intimacy of dialogue we have not yet encountered, an understatement in conveying its message, an absence of gesticulation of flourishes that are truly unprecedented. And it is this stillness that creates the right receptivity for the sublimities of the adagio and the pastoral good humor of the last two movements, the scherzo and the variation finale. Listening to this last sonata for violin and piano, one can't help speculating upon the fact that this new fusion of the two instruments this new integration of four movements into such a perfect whole marked the end of Beethoven's preoccupation with the problem violin piano sonata. It was, even for him, a consummation. 